All right, so this is our new chapter, and we're going to be focusing specifically on the cell membrane. So for starters, a little bit of history. Um, in early 20th century, they knew that uh, membranes were made of phospholipids, which we, of course, know today. They also knew that membranes contained cholesterol, and they also knew that membranes contained proteins. However, they didn't understand how all this was put together. And if you look here in this electron micrograph, um, what you're seeing here is actually two cell membranes. And I don't know how well you can see it, but here's black and black. And the black stains are the phosphate groups on the phospholipids. And the white in the middle here is your fatty acids. And then here's the gap in between. And here's another set of phosphates and fatty acids. Bottom line is they couldn't see the proteins, so they thought that the proteins must be on the surface somewhere. Um, and they were actually wrong about that. It's just the way the proteins are folded, they couldn't see them in their picture. What it really allowed them to understand the fluid mosaic model of the membrane, which is the model that we follow today, what really allowed them to see that uh, was a technique called freeze fracture. And it's exactly what it sounds like. They literally froze the membrane and then um, fractured it. Because it was frozen, they could actually peel the two layers apart. And so know what that is. Know what a freeze fracture technique is. And basically, like I said, you freeze it and you fracture it. You open it up and they could actually see now the phospholipids and the fact that, as you can see in this picture, that the proteins actually went through the membrane in some cases. So the fluid mosaic model, a mosaic is a picture um, sort of like if you've ever seen pictures that were like made of tiles. And then when you look at it from further back, it's actually a, uh, you know, a picture of something, but it's made of tiles. That's what a mosaic is. And uh, so this is called the fluid mosaic model. The mosaic comes from the proteins. You've got phospholipids, the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipids, that's your phosphate groups here, your phosphates, are pointing outward. And then the tails, which are your fatty acids, this you should know from the biochemistry chapter, that's why we covered that chapter, they face each other because they don't like water, they're hydrophobic. All right, um, phospholipids, they're unsaturated. What does that mean? That means they have double bonds in those fatty acids. And remember, double bonds cause these kinks or bends. And so this leaves the membrane fluid-like. It literally is fluid-like. Well, that's, that's the whole reason why in the previous chapter we discussed needing a cytoskeleton and the integrins and the extracellular matrix and things like cell walls because the membrane itself is very fluid-like. It's not overly sturdy as far as maintaining, um, you know, when it's under stress. Now, um, and if the membrane gets cooled too much, it won't actually work right, so it has to be fluid. A, a membrane that's too thick, things wouldn't pass through like they're supposed to. The proteins can be stuck in the membrane or they can also be on the surface of the membrane. Um, the ones that are, that are on the surface are called extrinsic, or another word you're, you're more likely to see, and I really just need to fix it in the PowerPoint, is sometimes they're called peripheral proteins because they're on the periphery. It doesn't mean they're only on the outside. They could be on the inside of the cell. In other words, a protein that's here um, or out here would be an extrinsic or peripheral protein. And then a membrane protein that's through the membrane like this, that's actually stuck in it, that would be called a transmembrane protein. So it literally goes through it. So peripheral proteins on the outside surface, either outside of the cell or inside of the cell, but lining the membrane, and then transmembrane proteins go through it. Um, and then in animal cells only, we have cholesterol. Keep this in mind. It's one of those trick kind of questions. There is no cholesterol in a plant cell membrane. If you saw a membrane and you can see cholesterol in it, it has to be animal cell. Plants have... Um, Different sterols, apparently, some of them do, but cholesterol is unique to animal cell membranes. So this is showing how proteins actually fold up. If you recall, proteins have that primary, secondary, tertiary. You can see the alpha helix structures here and how the entire protein is folded into a shape um, in the membrane. This is a picture of membrane just showing those cholesterol molecules. You need to remember what cholesterol looks like when you see those four rings fused together. That's a steroid. So these would be your cholesterol molecules. They're not actually showing any proteins in that picture. This is a diagram just showing uh, different ways that phospholipids can be shown. We learned what they looked like here in the biochemistry chapter, where we talked about the actual phosphate group and the glycerol and the fatty acids. 
Um, but now in this chapter, this is going to be basically represent your phosphate group, and this is going to be your fatty acids. That's a that's a the way you're going to see it drawn now. All right, and this is a picture from our previous chapter. You've seen this picture, um, but now we know a little more about it. So there's your phospholipid bilayer, hydrophobic here, hydrophilic here, where the phosphates are. Notice the cholesterol. This would be a peripheral protein. Notice how it's just on the surface. This is a transmembrane protein. They're calling it integral protein, but transmembrane, it goes across it. Um, and these here with these little green things coming off, these are glycoproteins, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. This is actually a glycolipid, where there's literally a sugar group attached to a lipid. And out here's the extracellular matrix, and inside we've got the cytoskeleton. Um, so this kind of shows the entire membrane intact. It's a little more complex, really, than um, I would want you to be able to draw or anything like that. This slide just shows how when lipids are unsaturated, how it prevents them from packing too tightly. And so it helps things to be able to pass through the membrane. And cholesterol here in the membrane also helps, particularly at low temperatures, it helps to maintain the fluidity of animal membranes. A few more things you should know. Lipids can move laterally, but they don't flip-flop. What the heck does that mean? Well, what we're talking about laterally means side to side. So if I was to look at sort of a three-dimensional picture of a cell membrane, so here is my membrane three-dimensionally, here's the outside, and now here is the inside. Hopefully you can kind of tell what I'm trying to do here. So I kind of drew this 3D. If I was to tag a lipid, let's say this one, and I watched it, where does it go? It might slide over here or over here. It could move laterally along the same side. This fossil lipid could end up anywhere. Now technically proteins, remember, are sort of locking things into place a little bit, but this could uh, flow. What you would not see this do, though, is it could not end up down here on the other side. And the reason why is because this phosphate is hydrophilic, and it would have to pass through this big, thick, hydrophobic area in order to get to the other side, and it's not going to be able to do that. So they can move laterally, but they cannot flip-flop to the other side. And the other thing about the membrane, the final thing, before we get into the proteins, is that the outside and the inside are not identical to each other. And that's because each side has a different job. So on the outside, you might have receptors that are picking up information from the environment. You don't need that on the inside. Um, you might have ID markers on the outside. Um, you might have transport proteins that face one way or the other way. So the outside and inside would not necessarily be identical. All right, and this is just an example, a little fishy here, just saying how might an Arctic fish living in a really cold environment have a different cell membrane? Well, it might have a membrane that's much higher in cholesterol, for example, um, because remember, cholesterol helps keep membranes fluid. And that's why maybe eating certain fish may be higher in cholesterol than eating other fish, because maybe you're eating fish that are coming from colder regions, and that's why they have high cholesterol, not because they eat a lot of fat, but because their cell membranes are structured that way to help them survive. The proteins in the membrane have different jobs, so I'm going to run through those really quick. They are actually the most important part. They fold up into their specific shapes, and there are five jobs we're going to run through really quick. The first one is transport. Transport, basically, those are proteins that let things go in and out, and they might require energy to do that. Um, cystic fibrosis is just an example of where a transport protein genetically is not structured correctly. The DNA has a mistake. The protein is wrong. And what it's supposed to do, you don't have to memorize this, but it's supposed to allow chloride ions to flow through. The faulty protein folds up tightly, the chloride ions get stuck in the cell, and this leads to mucus layers building up outside of the cells. And so people with cystic fibrosis have all this mucus buildup in their respiratory tract and in their intestinal tract. Um, and it's kind of a textbook example of a membrane protein, why membrane proteins are so important, and how a simple mistake genetically can lead to one protein being wrong that can lead to big problems. All right, the second one is enzymes. We're going to talk about enzymes in the next chapter, but enzymes catalyze reactions in the membrane. All that means is they speed up reactions. So you might have an enzyme protein in your membrane that speeds up reactions. Support fibers we already talked about. They hold the membrane shape. The in, uh, integrins we talked about that hook the outside to the inside. You also have the cytoskeleton. That's all made out of proteins. The um, extracellular matrix is protein. Receptors pick up information from the environment, from hormones, and then cause a reaction inside. 
So they don't actually bring the hormone in. For example, insulin might bind to a receptor protein, and then inside, that tells your cells to let sugar in. So that would be an example of a receptor in the membrane that causes a reaction. Surface glycoproteins. These are proteins with sugar stuck to them, and they provide recognition. They are actually ID markers. They have what are called oligosaccharides. It's a polysaccharide, a chain of sugars, but less than 15. Um, these are things that determine your blood type. This is what your antibodies are made of. This is how your body knows what cells belong to you, what, si what cells should not be attacked, and what cells should be attacked are these surface glycoproteins that identify your cells as belonging to you or not belonging to you. And here's a picture. So transport, enzymes, attachment areas. Here's a glycoprotein here with a sugar. See how the sugar's attached. Uh, this is a junction, and this is a receptor. The receptor, the signal binds, and then a reaction. It doesn't actually go in, but it causes a change inside that causes some kind of a reaction. So that's where we're going to stop. And next time we're going to talk about what can and cannot pass through the membrane.